Okay. Good afternoon. Those of you who have heard me uh, speak at the end of conferences before may be wondering what the organizers were thinking when they said this would take 20 minutes. Um, but we'll try to keep it down. Uh, I realize some of you have uh, trains and, and planes to catch. In the last few months, as I have thought about uh, coming to Prague for this conference and giving this talk, I have found myself thinking again and again about a man known in most of Europe as Johann Amos Comenius and uh, in Bohemia and Moravia as uh, Jan Amos Komensky. Uh, if you ask at the bookstore if there are any books by Comenius, they will look at you and say, but you're not Czech. No one outside of the Czech Republic has ever heard of Comenius. Um, so if they're right, I should probably uh, remind you if you uh, once knew who Comenius was or tell you if you, if you didn't who he was. He was a, uh, an important thinker of the 17th century. He was born in 1592, died in 1670. He was a Protestant. He was a member of the religious group known as the, uh, the Unity of the Brethren, Unitas Fratrum, which was uh, an intellectual descendant of the Czech religious reformer Jan Hus. He was ordained. Uh, he became eventually a minister, a, a bishop of the Unitas Fratrum. And um, he spent his life leading that church, mostly, however, in exile, because um, just about 400 years ago this year, the Habsburgs uh, regained control of Bohemia and Moravia and, attempt and started uh, a determined effort at the re-Catholicization of uh, the area and uh, the suppression of religious dissent including these uh, pre-Reformation Protestants who had been a thorn in their sides for a long time. Uh, so Comenia spent most of his life in exile, uh, and uh, his life is actually a very depressing uh, life to read if you care about books and philosophy, because he, he wrote book after book about uh, the unity of knowledge and wisdom and uh, finding religious harmony and time after time, he was forced into exile. His village was burned down. His library was destroyed. There are a number of books that we know he wrote that we don't have the text for because um, they were burned down in the 30, burned in the Thirty Years' War. Uh, but he's regarded by a number of people as an extremely inspiring figure, partly for his devotion to uh, the unity of all knowledge. Pan Sophia, as he called it. He's an important precursor for the, encyc in the encyclopedicists of uh, the 18th century in France. Uh, and he was a tremendous innovator as an educator. Uh, one of the first things that the, uh, the Unity of the Brethren did in exile was set up schools for their children. And uh, Comenius was entrusted with this task. And he pioneered new forms of pedagogy. Uh, and he wrote textbooks, which are, uh, which are still re highly regarded today. Uh, we'll come back to some of those later. And you may be thinking now pretty much what I thought when the name Comenius kept coming to me as I was preparing for this talk. Um, OK, uh, yeah, he's Czech, uh, so that connects. He didn't actually have anything to, much to do with Prague. He lived here for a very brief period, but he, he has no strong associations with Prague. He was Moravian, not Bohemian. Um, and he wrote, uh, you know, he was a learned man, but he, he wrote in a style which is clearly the style of the 17th century. And uh, so there are no punchy quotes. It, the, I, I, there will be no slides because there are no bumper sticker slogans you can pull out of uh, any of Comenius's work. Uh, he grows on you very slowly. It's very difficult for anyone who has actually read much of his work or, uh, or studied Latin from any of his textbooks 
not to have a tremendous affection for the man, not to have an admiration for the man, but it's kind of difficult to explain why. You, you, can only, you get it through experience, not through explanation. And then it occurred to me, uh, well, perhaps the reason I keep thinking about Comenius is that at a certain level of abstraction, most of the description I've just given you is also what people say about XML. Gosh, it's verbose, um, and the virtue that those people who have practiced descriptive markup in their own work find in it is kind of difficult to convey in words. It's much easier to explain if you have experienced it. Now, of course, it's also true, perhaps this is another parallel, um, Comenius's troubles, you know, his exile, his, uh, his prescription, the burning of his books, uh, and so forth, uh, in a way, all of his problems started with standardization because uh, the motivation for the changes that led to his exile was to eliminate an unnecessary and harmful variety in religious belief. Uh, no rulers of the 17th century really thought it was a good idea to have varieties of religious belief in their domains, so they set out to suppress it. And um, uh, lots of people will tell you that's what standardization is all about, is making things be the same and eliminating undesirable variation. That is one approach to what I'll call universality. Be all things to all people. Make your claim to applicability universal. And uh, along the way, benefit from certain network effects uh, and eliminate all competing points of view in the technical sphere, eliminate all competing technologies. Uh, in that sense, for example, HTML has, uh, has succeeded in hypertext by destroy, effectively destroying all other approaches to hypertext. It's one of the reasons that so many people who care a lot about hypertext are so ambivalent about the web. Uh, it seems pretty much to have destroyed uh, the possibility for wide adoption of many of the properties of hypertext that they cared about in the first place, uh, certainly sophisticated properties of hypertext. Uh, and in that, if you, if you think of that as the, the implicit aim for any technology, then it's understandable that in talks like uh, the ones we had yesterday morning from Eric van der Vliet or uh, Anna von Kesteren or the, uh, the, dual, uh, the dual show from uh, Robin Bergeron and, and Norm Walsh about the XML-HTML cross-fertilization task force, uh, all of those, either all the way through or from time to time, give you the impression or, or pose the question, if XML has not become universal in its usage, hasn't it failed? Hasn't it failed to achieve its goals? If JSON exists and there are people who prefer to use JSON over using XML, doesn't that mean that XML has failed? And if you believe that the implicit goal of any technology is to eliminate all of its competition, then almost by definition, yes. Of course, by the same definition, JSON has also failed because there are some people who prefer to use XML even though JSON exists. And as long as I'm here, it will continue to be the case. At another level, however, is it possible to fail at something you never tried to do? Uh, Eric displayed the goals that were set at the beginning of the working group on SGML on the web and were published in the XML spec. None of them included world domination. None of them included the elimination of all other notations for data or all other methods of organizing data. As Jenny pointed out early on, there was an awful lot of hype, and Eric again, and as 
anyone who was uh, around at the time can remember, there was an awful lot of hype. Much of the hype, of course, produced by marketing people who were told to create a market for a technology that they didn't really understand. And so they asked the people who did understand it for, for characterizations. And uh, there's a, a game of telephone tag or telephone uh, that you can see in the, in the marketing literature as things that are true, if you understand them properly, get translated and paraphrased into things that are progressively less and less true. Uh, and people who hear about, heard about XML for the first time through some of that marketing hype may well think that the goal was, uh, was universal uh, dominance because for all the Sun marketing people knew that that was what it was all about. There was an awful lot of misinformation spread at the time. But, uh, there, and it's difficult for anyone now to say that was never a goal of XML because XML was, of course, the product of a large group of people. There were hundreds of people involved in the working group and they didn't necessarily have all the same goals. They didn't necessarily have consistent goals in the same head. My goals were certainly not necessarily all consistent with each other. Um, so all I can say is it wasn't part of my goal. I wanted to be able to use SGML on the web. And for that, uh, that goal has been achieved. I use SGML on the web now. It's the way I run all my websites. Uh, life is much better for me now that I, I can do that. And um, in some sense, I can go home now. I'm done. Um, everything I wanted, I've got. And I've got more because we've got uh, XSLT, we've got XQuery, we have all sorts of interesting technologies built on that. Years and years ago, a prominent person in the SGML community, a man named Yuri Rubinsky, gave a talk that, that uh, I did not hear but I heard about again and again because it impressed, it, it struck a lot of people. And in this talk, he said, when will SGML be a real success? SGML, descriptive markup, will be a real success when it's used everywhere and no one knows it's there. When it's like the tunnels under Disneyland and there are wonderful rides and everyone is happy and everyone enjoys the things that, that, uh, that you can do at Disneyland or Disney World, but they don't go to Disney World to see the tunnels and they don't know about the machinery that's used to build the tunnels or the wires that run through them, although I'm sure that you can imagine, I'm sure that you will all believe there are plenty of tunnels in Disneyland and plenty of wires running through them and plenty of uh, uh, interesting and not so interesting data running over those wires. And if you take that standard, then the fact that Word and Excel and OpenOffice now save in an XML-based format means, again, Yuri's prediction has come true. Descriptive markup and SGML are a huge success because they are everywhere and no one knows. No one has to know. They're everywhere in other ways as well. I am told that if you are caught speeding in North Carolina, the policeman writes you a ticket in XML. The traffic cop doesn't actually see the angle brackets. They see a form. They fill it out. The form sends a record of your, uh, your traffic offense to the central database and it sends it in XML and uh, eventually a bill gets sent to your, your address. In the same way, when you pump gas at many gas stations, well, you know for sure that there, is, there are signals going between the gasoline pump and the cash register inside. And in the US at least, there's at least a 50% chance that the signals running under your feet connecting the gas pump and the cash register are XML. Uh, the chances are much higher if they are made by different vendors. The chances are somewhat lower if they're made by the same vendor because vendors um, tend to prefer to use their own formats. 
for exactly the same reasons that Eric pointed out. Uh, we know exactly what's going on. We don't need to be understandable to other people and so forth. Um, when your carburetor talks to the diagnostic machine at the repair shop, it's talking XML. So XML is in all the tunnels, in a lots of places in our infrastructure, and we don't need to know or care about it. So in that sense, XML won. Comenius, on the other hand, never really tried to convert everyone in Europe to his faith. Um, the, the unity of the brethren was not noted for its missionary zeal. They were not the Mormons of 17th century, uh, 17th century Europe. Uh, their primary goal at the time was the preservation of religious toleration, which had been achieved in Bohemia and Moravia and Slovakia uh, at a certain amount of, uh, after a certain amount of difficulty, after a certain, with a certain amount of cost. And uh, the outbreak of the Thirty Years' War was caused precisely by the resistance in Bohemia and Moravia to the re-Catholicization efforts of the Habsburgs. So let's think about another way of living, not domination, not elimination of, of all alternatives, but peaceful, peaceful coexistence among alternatives. This is may be part of the maturation process that Jenny Tennyson was describing in her opening the other day. Uh, one of the things that you have to learn when you grow up is that you have to live with other people and they will not always think the same way you do. Uh, it's part of being a grown-up. Uh, now, pluralism of some sort has always been built into descriptive markup uh, as long as there have been technologies based on descriptive markup. Uh, in SGML, there is a notation declaration present in XML DTDs as well. It's also present in XSD for mostly historical reasons. Very few people use notation declarations. Very few people understand what they're there for. But one of the things they are there for is, one of the things we can use them for, is as a signal that the people who designed SGML and XML did not think everything in the world was going to be in SGML or XML. They knew perfectly well there would be things in other notations that would need to be that would need to be included in the same system as the SGML or XML documents that they were trying to design. That is one reason that SGML and most SGML vocabularies, including HTML, have st uh, store image, don't store images as part of the document format. It's a huge difference between SGML and XML-based languages and most binary document languages. Word doesn't want to point at an image somewhere else. It wants it as part of this document. Any word processor pretty much feels the same way. But the designers of SGML said, not without reason, there are lots of people interested in image formats, and what we care about most is being able to coexist with them, not prevent new image formats. And that's one of the reasons that multimedia went global in an SGML-based system and not in a proprietary binary format. You get a similar kind of pluralism in uh, one of the fundamental decisions of SGML and XML, which is not to define a standard tag set, but instead to move up a level and define a meta-language that allows anyone to define their own tag set. And another reflex of the same pluralism I see in, in uh, technologies like NVDL that George Bina talked about the other day. There doesn't need to be, there isn't any need to, for there to be a single validation technology or a single validation language. And if you're going to have more than one, it's convenient to have technologies for managing them. And NVDL is a good example of that. There's another form of universality that we saw a lot of here. Not, necessarily, not, not an attempt to be all things to all people, which is part of what the original hype about XML did wrong. 
but what you might call an attempt to be all things to at least some people. Um, the attempt to extend existing XML-based tools to handle more cases, to handle a broader range of data, to handle non-XML data. Um, the work on XPROC that Wojciech Toman described the other day, uh, JSONIC that uh, Jonathan Roby presented on behalf of uh, a cast of uh, several people, if not thousands. Uh, Jason Hunter's paper presented by Norm Walsh about uh, uh, corona and the ability to work with uh, JSON in an X query based system. Stephen Pemberton's uh, report on the efforts in the XForms group to allow XForms to operate on JSON data and to write JSON data back out. All of those are an attempt to allow those who want to work with XML based technologies to continue to work with that technology and not have to move to other languages or other technologies just because the format of the data that you're working with has changed. Now, there is a danger here. It's precisely the danger that Jenny Tennyson pointed out. All of these are chimeras in the terminology she was using. All of these run the risk of being lipstick on a pig. Um, maybe she's right. Maybe we should be staying away from those things. But on the whole, I liked all of that work. I'm very happy with all of that work. I don't see any reason for us to avoid doing something in XML just because someone else has found a way to do it in some other form. It is quite true, at least I'll accept it as an abstract principle, that a given technology, when pushed into a new area, might not work in a, in a perfect and beautiful way. But sometimes it does work perfectly fine. Sometimes there's no particular reason for, to do it in one way or another. Uh, there's no particular reason that you have to use Java to parse, uh, to parse XML. If you happen to be a COBOL programmer and you happen to be maintaining a large system written in, exclusively in, in COBOL, you might want a, an XML parser in COBOL. There's no reason to avoid building an XML parser in COBOL just because there already exist XML parsers in other languages. Of course, you don't need to write an XML parser for COBOL because long since part of most COBOL distributions, or so I'm told. Um, why, after all, should those guys in the other notation have all the fun? Let's have some of the fun in our own notation. Uh, just as and for the same reason, we should not begrudge the JavaScript people their desire to have some of the benefits of XSLT, even if they can't have all of them. So go ahead. Go to town. Much better if you do it in CSS, though, I agree. The uh, part of pluralism, of course, is living peaceably with your neighbors, coexisting, interacting uh, constructively with your environment. Um, as Eric enjoined us yesterday morning, forget the old battles, let bygones be bygones, uh, move on. And uh, Alain Couturier's uh, method of compiling xQuery into JavaScript seems to me a good example of that approach. It would be nice if browser vendors built XQuery into the browser, just as it would be nice if they built X XSLT2 into the browser. But um, if they won't, and they, they say the only thing we want to have in the browser is JavaScript, then by all means, let's compile to JavaScript so that those who want to work at a certain level of abstraction with a certain data model can do so. You want to work with XSLT2 in the browser? You can do that too, as long as, uh, uh, as long as people like Michael Kay are around to build Saxon CE. Now, of course, living, interacting, cooperating with uh, other people and other technologies teaches you sometimes uh, things that you'd like to have a little different in the technologies you use. It's a little bit like living in a house and discovering after a while that it's, it's kind of small. You need a bigger house. There are two things, 
at least there are three things you can do. You can tear down the house, lay new foundations, and build a new house. You can take the current house down and rebuild on the same foundations, if you like the current shape. Or you can add on. And quite often, the best thing to do, and sort of almost always the lowest cost thing to do, is to keep the existing house and add on to it. And sometimes you'll see complexes of buildings where one building turned out to be too small, and there are no further buildings for the institution right next door. For example, where we are now. This is not the first building of the Prague School of Economics. It's the second or the third. Um, fourth. fourth. There we go. This is the new building is presumably the second one built. This is not the new building. This is the uh, fourth building. In some cases, you end up with the old structure at the center and a lot of uh, outbuildings around it or a lot of extensions. In some cases, you end up with uh, what was originally the main building or the only building is now the east wing, is one, one wing of a multi-wing building. All of those are possible. You get a lot of mileage by not ripping up those old foundations. And in the same way, I think if you really need to have prescribed methods of error recovery, it makes sense to do it as a separate add-on spec, not as a spec that changes the fundamental rules that, were, that have been built into XML and that have now been built into a lot of people's heads over the last however many years it's been. Perhaps the main reason to think about someone like Comenius is that thinking about his life forces us to face the question, what counts as success? What counts as failure? To the extent that Comenius had an overriding, an overarching intellectual goal, it was to demonstrate the unity of all knowledge. And as various cultural historians have pointed out, uh, well, as far as the advance of science is concerned, the 17th century really belonged to the development of uh, increasing specialization. And um, the people, people like Comenius, who were trying to establish the unity of all sciences, uh, were not part of that, were not part of the scientific revolution. Uh, to the extent that he had an overarching political goal, it was to reestablish religious toleration in Bohemia and Moravia. And in that, too, he failed. Uh, he, uh, he was, as I said, the bishop of the Unity of the Brethren. He was the last bishop of the Unity of the Brethren because after the Treaty of Westphalia, it became clear that they could never come back from exile. And uh, so. He instructed the congregations of the movement to join the Lutheran or Calvinist churches uh, if they could. Religious freedom was established in most parts of Europe by the Treaty of Westphalia, but not in the Habsburg lands. But of course, the idea of religious freedom didn't die with the Treaty of Westphalia. It is enshrined today in the uh, UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And it stands to reason that Comenius failed to achieve finally, to reach the final achievement of his goals, because the goals for which he strove are goals that take more than a single human lifetime to achieve. Many of them have not yet been achieved, and we still have to work on them. The ideals of achieving a true understanding of the world, achieving tolerance for multiple viewpoints, even on subjects that are really important to us, and therefore on which we are tempted to tolerate no dissent. And the ideal of universal education, which is the idea for which Comenius is probably best known today, are as important now as they were 400 years ago. Now, what we do is not necessarily quite on the same plane, but it, it seems related to me. We are interested in building technologies that allow us 
and allow our users to say what is important about the information that they are managing, to do what they want to do with that information. If in our lifetimes we can contribute to that goal, we will have contributed to the goal, to the goals of a better understanding of the world and better toleration for multiple viewpoints. How do we make that happen? Well, among other things, we squabble with each other, we argue with each other, we, um, we blow each other's minds out by um, uh, demonstrations of higher order of functions. Um, I've learned not to sit close to other people when John Snelson talks because the shrapnel from exploding heads <laughs> can get dangerous. We make jokes for each other. We make jokes about DocBook and about JavaScript, and uh, we spur each other to improvements of our technology. Since I want to live in a world that has moved a little bit closer to those goals, I thank you for being here and arguing with each other so productively for the last two days. Thank you very much. <laughs>